There has been one question that children, adults, and mathematicians alike have pondered for the longest time. That is, how many holes a straw has? First of all, what's the definition of a hole precisely? This question can be viewed through a mathematical lens. How have mathematicians, topologists in particular, who study how objects move in relation to each other, how have they thought about holes? In our day-to-day -day language, we refer to holes in numerous ways. One of these ways is as a cavity, such as a pit dug in the ground. Another way is as an opening in an object, like a hole punch in a piece of paper. Yet another is an encased space, like an air pocket in Swiss cheese. If you ask a topologist, they will say that all except the first example would be considered a hole. But to understand why, or even why mathematicians care about holes in the first place, we must look through the history of topology and how it's different from its close relative, geometry. In geometry, we use rigid objects like circles and polyhedra, and the main tools we use are lengths, angles, and area. Topology is different in the sense that shapes can be stretched and twisted, as if made from rubber. You can even cut and glue together parts of the shape as long as the cut made was completely and precisely re-glued. A sphere and a cube are considered different geometric objects, but in a topological sense, they're identical. If you want mathematical proof that a shirt and a pair of pants are different, you would ask a topologist and not a geometer, as the main difference is that they have a different amount of holes. Leonard Euler started the topological exploration of shapes back in the 18th century. It's a general assumption that by then, mathematicians knew almost all there was to be known about polyhedra. But in 1750, Euler discovered one of the all-time great theorems, which states that if polyhedron has f polygonal faces, e edges, and v vertices, then v minus e plus f equals 2. For example, a soccer ball has 20 white hexagonal and 12 black pentagonal patches for a total of 32 faces, as well as 90 edges and 60 vertices. Following the theorem, 60 minus 90 plus 32 equals 2. This seemingly elementary observation has many deep connections to a lot of areas of mathematics, but it's simple enough for kindergartners to learn. This observation was not made by centuries of geometers like Euclid, Archimedes, and Kepler because the outcome is not dependent on geometry. It depends on the shape itself. Therefore, it's topological. Euler implied that the polyhedra would be convex, meaning that any line segment connecting any two points would be completely within the polyhedron. Soon enough, though, scholars found non-convex exceptions to the formula. In 1813, Swiss mathematician Simon Le Houllier found that if we create a hole in a polyhedron to make it look more donut-shaped, therefore changing the topology, then v minus e plus f equals zero. An interesting note is that while Euler and Le Houllier imagine their polyhedra to be solid, Euler's formula is computed using only zero-dimensional vertices, one-dimensional edges, and two-dimensional faces. So Euler's number is actually created from the two-dimensional surface of a polyhedron, aka we could consider them hollow. Overall, all that matters is the topology of the object. Let's imagine we make a polyhedron out of clay, mark the edges with a sharpie, and squish it into a ball. The faces and edges may have become curved, but their number doesn't change because of this. So for any shape that's topologically a sphere, its Euler number is 2. For a donut like torus, it's 0. For a flat disk, it's 1 so on and so forth. Each surface has its own Euler number. This topological view of Euler's formula 
where the shapes were rubber-like and not rigid, was first introduced in an article by Johann Listing in 1861. Around the same time, Bernard Riemann was studying surfaces that showed up in his study of complex numbers. He figured out that the number of holes in an object could be found by seeing how many times the object could be cut without producing two pieces. For a surface with a boundary, or ends, like a straw with its two boundary circles, each cut must begin and end on a boundary. So, according to Riemann, because a straw can only be cut once, from end to end, it must have one hole. If the surface doesn't have a boundary, like a torus, the first cut must begin and end at the same point. A hollow torus can be cut twice, once around the tube and then along the resulting cylinder. So by definition, it has two holes. The next person to add on was Henri Poincaré, and he did so by publishing the groundbreaking 123-page article Analysis Citus in 1895. With it and its five sequels, he introduced many ideas that would blossom later on. Notable among these was the concept of homology, which he introduced to take Riemann's ideas to higher dimensions. Through homology, Poincaré sought to capture all of Riemann's one-dimensional, circle-like holes, like in a straw or binder paper, to the two-dimensional, cavity-like holes inside Swiss cheese, and beyond, to higher dimensions. The number of these holes, one for each dimension, became known as the Betty numbers. Roughly stated, homology is a way to associate a certain mathematical object or something that can be formally assigned, to each shape. From this object, we can get simpler information about the shape, like its Euler number or its Betty number. Let's get a sense of homology by starting at dimension 1. Imagine a loop, like a ring, going over a surface. The loops can slip and slide around, and even cross each other, but they cannot go off the surface. Some surfaces, like a circular disk or a sphere, allows a loop to squish down to a single point. Such places have trivial homology. But other surfaces, like a straw or a torus, have loops that envelop their holes. These have non-trivial homology. We can visualize Betty numbers with a torus. We can create an infinite amount of loops around one, and they can wind, double back, and wrap around before ending up where they started. Let's call a loop that goes around the central hole and around the tube once, A. Now this serves as the base of other loops. Since a loop can go around the tube of the torus any number of times, and the direction matters, we can portray those loops as A, 2A, negative A, and so on. However, not every loop is a multiple of A, such as the loop going around the central hole along the tube's long circumference, which we can call B. At this point, there's no new trips that we can make. Any loops on the torus can be contorted to follow A and B some integer amount of times. The fact that there are two one-dimensional loops from which all the others can be built off means that the Betty number of this torus in dimension one is two, which is the same as the number of Riemann's cuts. In this image, if loop C is loop A combined with loop B, we can write C equals A plus B. It's possible to make this arithmetic, the addition and subtractions of the loops, sound. In MathLingo, a set that allows things to be added and subtracted within it is called a group. For example, on the torus, the one-dimensional homology group consists of expressions such as 7a plus 5b, 2a minus 3b, and so on. 
So finally, how do topologists count holes? Using the Betty numbers. The zeroth Betty number, or B0, is a special case, as it just counts the numbers of objects. For one connected shape, B0 equals 1. And as we just saw before, B1 is the number of circular holes in a shape, like the circle on a cylindrical straw, or the two directions of a torus. The second Betty number, B2, is the number of cavities, like those inside a torus and Swiss cheese. More generally, Bn counts the number of n-dimensional holes. Oddly enough, we can take this trail all the way back to Euler. Just as Euler's number for a surface can be computed with vertices, edges, and faces, it can also be computed with its Betty numbers, b0 minus b1 plus b2. The torus, for instance, is connected, so b0 equals 1, it has b1 equals 2, as we've seen, and because it has one internal cavity, b2 equals 1. Just as Le Houlier no noted, the Euler number of the torus is 1 minus 2 plus 1, which equals 0. Topology has many uses in the real world, as can be explored here, if you look down in the description, and not only for counting the number of holes in a straw.